Hello, everyone. Welcome to the AGI Forum. Today, we're very lucky to have、uh, our guest speaker, Lumna Ben Alal, who is in Hugging Face Machine Learning Engineer, and she's currently working on a Hugging Face Big Code project. That's a very exciting project. And today's interview, we are going to discuss the Big Code project and also what、um, Lumna think about. Machine-generated code development、uh, that impact the software development in that community. And、uh, first of all,、uh, please give us an inter-、uh, an overview of、um, Hugging Face Big Code project and its main objective. Yeah, so the Big Code project is a collaboration between Hugging Face and ServiceNow, and the goal is to build the strong code generation models. So these are models that can auto complete your code. For example, a bit like、uh, the VS Code extension released by Microsoft called GitHub Copilot. So we're trying to develop models that can do that, but in a responsible and open approach. So this is an open source project where everyone can join, and we're also very transparent about what data we're using, what techniques we're using for the curation and training. So we were hoping that this can、uh, create a new collaborative、uh, space in the open source community in this field. Okay, awesome. So what can you tell us? What inspired you to start this project, and what exactly the opportunities or challenges that you were trying to?、Uh, Try to、uh, meet when you created this project. Yeah, so Big Code is a follow-up of Big Science, which was the project that was started by Hugging Face, where a lot of researchers from different companies and、uh, research institutes tried to train the Bloom, which is a large language model. So after that, we were like, maybe we should do that also for code. And with some researchers from ServiceNow, we both aligned about how this model should be open source and what data governance standards we should respect. So we decided to create Big Code. It's like open collaboration where we can have external collaborators, and we can all work together to try to develop these models. Yeah. So,、um, can you tell us the difference between you know、um, a Big Code project and、um, the other code generation、um, machine learning tools out there? What's the primary difference? I think、uh, the primary difference is how open the project it is and our data governance standards. So, unlike some other models in our training data, we try to use only permissively licensed code, and we try to remove personal identifiable information. We also release code attribution tools with our model to try to kind of、uh, attribute those people whose code we used. So, for example, the stack, which is the training dataset that we used, we have an opt-out tool where people can go and check if their code is on our training data. If they want, they can ask to be removed. So I think that's one key difference compared to other projects, and also we didn't just release the model. We released the model, the training data,、uh, VS Code extension, all documentation, scripts to find you on the model. So we're trying to make it easy to use this model and also more reproducible. Can you just share with us the、uh, some of the momentums you have achieved? Like how many developers、uh, that you're that working on earlier? I see there was a lot of. You know, college students and P,、uh, graduate students—they were very excited about Hugging Face's big code project. So, can you just give us some examples of some numbers on you know the momentum that、uh, Big Code has achieved? Yeah, so Big Code has grown a lot since we started a year ago.、Uh, so, I think now, for example, just to give you a number in our Slack channel, I think more than a thousand people joined. Wow! So, these are people who want to follow how the project is going, but also who some of them are willing to contribute. And for example, if you go to see our papers, for example, the stack of our Star Coder,、uh, there are a lot of authors in that paper, which shows how everyone is trying to collaborate to develop these models. And、uh, regarding tools that we release, we have, for example, VS Code the extension, which has tens of thousands of installs. And you can also see, like, the model page, how many people are downloading the model. So yeah, there is a lot of people who are trying to help us make this, but also a lot of people are using our tools.、Mm -hmm. How far away are you from the completion of the Big Code project? And what do you hope to, you know, achieve more, like, you know, next release? Yeah. So Big Code is kind of、um, we first had an iteration which lasted seven to eight months. So it ended when we released Star Coder. But now we're starting another iteration, so we're gonna try to release another model, which is hopefully much stronger. And、uh, yeah, this new iteration just started maybe a month ago,、mm -hmm. and we're gonna do the same. We're gonna try to train a new model and release it, and after that, we're gonna see what happens next.、Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, I hope that you know we'll get more developers joining this project. And、um, from a user standpoint, what do you think about the use cases of Big Code? How would users benefit from the Big Code project? 
Yeah, so in Vic Code, uh, we're trying to develop models that can complete your code. But also a few instruction to in them, you can use them as a chatting assistant, for example, like ChatGPT or um, but it's an open alternative. So one way that people can use these tools, for example, as an individual developer, you can use the VS Code extension to, it should help you increase your productivity. And uh, one other way is to, for example, go to a playground and play, for example, with Star Chat Beta. And one other thing that's useful is that because our model is open source and also so is our data set, people can use this model and fine tune it for their use cases. Mm -hmm. So like the Moon community has released some wonderful models. So these are like instruction tuned models that you can use as a chatting assistant. I can, I can see the benefit of, you know, getting the BigCode project within your own data center. In that case, this you have more control of yeah. the security, exactly. especially data. And because, you know, companies got confidential information and the last thing you want is to have your confidential information being shared with everybody else yeah, in the exactly. world. Yeah, so people can just take the model and deploy it on premise. Right. And for example, we have a lot of companies reach out to us. They have their own developers, they have their own mm -hmm. code bases. They would like to have their own version of Curve Pilot, which is like internal and deployed mm -hmm. on premise. So for example, with StarCoder, they can do that. Mm -hmm. And then the best thing is it's free. Yeah, exactly, and it's free. Yeah. Charge. And then they can also commercialize the you know the big code project um, and then sell it to their downstream users yeah they can take the model and do all things on top that they can sell uh, so it, the license allows commercial use because it's a real like permissive license that's awesome and um you can see which verticals do you think would adopt you know a project like big code first i mean you we have you know obviously like healthcare legal you know education and from your perspective which verticals do you think would have the easiest time to adopt the big code project i think any for example company or domain who has a code base they could benefit from this mm -hmm. project since they have their own developers and they probably want to develop like an, a version of like a coding mm -hmm. assistant for them so i think it can go from banking to health to anything it's like as mm -hmm. long as there's code and as long as this programming language is supported by the model, mm -hmm. uh, it should be easier to adapt to it. Mm -hmm. So do you see that um, having a you know AI generated code tool is revolutionizing the way we do software? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's definitely helping. Uh, for example, I think there were some studies that showed that a lot of people prefer using Copilot and that it helps them with, especially with some repetitive tasks, mm -hmm. like writing unit tests or documentation. So it's definitely creating like uh, a new generation of coding. Some people might use it, for example, ChatGPT now is trying to use their, solve their homework, stuff like that. So we should, I think we should use these tools in a smart way. Mm -hmm. um, but they have their own challenges, which are security challenges. So I think, yeah, it comes with like challenges and advantages and we should be very careful when using these tools. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I can see a lot of developers get really excited about this tool, but then, you know, at the end of the day, um, AI cannot replace human creativity. I mean, uh, you know, at least today. So in the future, we don't know, but um, we still think that developers' jobs will not be replaced. And um, AI can, you know, especially GAI tool can help enhance developer work. And in fact, I think, um, you know, um, I've, I've seen reports saying uh, developers who use this kind of machine learning type of a code generation tools are a lot happier developers because they don't have to spend a lot of time on you know boring stuff and then they do a lot of developers hate writing documentation and so yeah. so having a tool like that can really help improve the quality of their work experience don't you think so yeah exactly yeah, yeah. and yeah. i think i mean ultimately we want tools that they don't just that don't just write documentation and boring stuff we want them to be able to do like more creative tools uh, right. tasks right. but yeah it's never gonna be up to the level of like human development i think it's just a lot of right. hype uh, these are tools to help you become more productive maybe explore new things mm -hmm. for example you want to learn a new programming language it's probably gonna easy if you get started with for example so yeah it could have some creative areas to help you on but it's definitely not there to replace anything because now it's still like working at the file level completing your function completing your class but it doesn't for example generate new code bases or like very complex code so yeah we're very far from having something that's like yeah do, but do you think one day the tool will get so mature that all we need to do is to say i would like to write a program that does abc and then that's it boom everything's done perfectly do you think we'll ever get to that point or 
you know, or it's still, it's not, it's not a possible goal. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's kind of like the end goal. It's probably going to take a lot of time. But yeah, I think it's like done step by step. What do you think companies should do in yeah. terms of like governance, like how the companies can ensure that, you know, IP is protected and also ethics, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, so first it starts with like the base model that they're using. Mm -hmm. So we should start, for example, from a base model that you know already respected that, for example, circular model, where we know what data went in there. You can check yourself which licenses we trained on. And then you should also have like code attribution tools. This is very important because it's not enough to use code that has a permissive license. If the model generates code that was exactly copied from the training, you should give attribution to the author. So this is why, for example, in our VS Code extension, we have a membership test which checks if code generated was copied. And this way you can see where it came from. So I think, yeah, definitely data attribution in the base model should already be respecting what standards you have. And uh, these are like kind of uh, what could help with data governance. And then there are things like opt out, for example, because when you take code from GitHub, maybe people don't want to be in your training data. So if you give them the possibility to kind of opt out or remove their data from there, that's like a nice feature to have. Okay, awesome. Well, that, that's really great. Um, AI is here to stay. And um, the way to do it is to create a collaborative environment to make sure that developers are using this tool safely and then it can truly help them with their productivity. Can you tell us that what data you use to train the big code uh, yeah. large model? Yeah, so we use data from GitHub. We basically cloned all of GitHub and then we filtered only for permissive licenses and we kept only the programming languages that we're interested in. So that was um, roughly 86 programming languages. And after that, we did like uh, some manual cleaning. We did some inspection to see which filters make sense, for example, to remove auto-generated code. And so from six terabytes of code that we had from GitHub that was permissibly licensed, we ended up with around less than a terabyte just to mm -hmm. see how much we cleaned. We also removed like a lot of duplicates because this helps apparently uh, the model during the mm -hmm. training. So there was a lot of data curation to go from a very large massive data set that is very noisy to a data set that the model would benefit from during the training. Mm -hmm. So this project is obviously an ongoing project. What kind of help are you looking for? Is it more data to help us improve the model and or more you know developers who can help you you know fine tune or optimize the model and um, what are the yeah. things that you're looking for i think there are a lot of things to explore in this field and a lot of challenges so first there's like the data curation so for example files for each language and people kind of look through them so some people in the big code community helps with that and then for example in the training sometimes you could just use advice of people who already trained these models uh, it was very collaborative effort we had some for example some researchers who gave us like some insights into for example what new tricks to use and what to do not and after that there's also evaluation i think like there's like a big challenge in that field uh, because like few main codecs was released, people focused on Python a lot, mm -hmm. so there were no benchmarks to evaluate the model on other languages. That's when researchers, for example, from Northeastern University in the US, they developed a benchmark called MultiPLE, which has more than 80 programming languages that you can test your model on. And then you want to test your model not just for function completion, mm -hmm. you want to test it for more complex tasks, for example, to use PyTorch or TensorFlow. That's when there are some other benchmarks to work on. So the community could help either in data curation, in developing new benchmarks, but also in fine tuning. For example, we released the model and people figured out which fine tuning makes best mm -hmm. and uh, just techniques for how to improve performance. Mm. So I, obviously the role of the community is so important to the success of the Big Code project. So can you tell us about the community? Like, you know, who have you had involved in your community and you know, where else you're looking for more community to to um, participate in the project? And is your community mostly based in US or in Europe? Um, do you see more, you know, developers coming out of like China or um, other regions? Yeah, I think the community is like very distributed. We have more than 30 countries. Uh, so yeah, we have uh, people from all over the world. Yeah, and one aspect I forgot to mention is like we need help with the engineering part, but also with the data governance part. So we've had like lawyers who join uh, Big Code and they give like some very valuable insights on which licenses to use, how to develop the code attribution tools, but, but also on that side. So yeah, it's like um, people with different backgrounds and also from different uh, countries. So there's a huge difference 
And um, so I'm glad, I'm really glad that Bitco project um, is, you know, is doing both open source and um, open governance. What about, you know, ethics? So yeah, I think that's like a very important area. So what we've tried to do, it first starts, for example, with the data you use and you, for example, the opt-out mechanism that we've set up so that people can check if their data is in our training set and can opt out and remove their data. That's like one step forward to respecting that aspect. And then there's the attribution tools so that we can respect the original license that we used and we can give credit to the people that whose code is being generated. There's also that aspect. There's, for example, also the removal of personal identifiable information because mm -hmm. some people put like uh, API keys in their code. There's also names, uh, emails. So we've tried to remove all of that from our training data so that our model does not generate it during inference. Um, so there's also the license of uh, the model, so it is a code ML open rail. It allows uh, the use of the model for commercial use without any royalty, but it has some ethical restrictions. For example, uh, people can take the model and use it for malware generation. So we've tried to set up some things to make sure that the model is used in, in the best way, but also not to limit the open source community so it, that it can leverage the model and build on top of it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Wow, th this is great. I mean, you know, we want to make sure that when we are creating technology, we want to make sure that, yeah. you know, we're responsible, you know, accountable um, for the technologies that we're creating. We want the technology to help us improve our quality of lives and not cause harm. Thank you very much for tuning in and thank you for thank joining. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.